Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Frayne Olson analyzes this week's active movement in the soybean market. Tom Hunt updates us on his research with aphid tolerance in soybeans. Aaron Berger talks about marketing this year's calf crop. Aaron Stalker explains how producers can store distillers grains. And Greg Kruger describes weed control under Roundup Ready Extend and Enlist Duo soybean systems. North Dakota State Extension economist Frayne Olson is our market analyst this week. We talked with Frayne Thursday morning about selling strategies for corn going into harvest, the current condition of spring wheat, and the big soybean price swings this week, especially from the September contract. Well, as, as we move to the end of the expiration date for the September contract, that's also the switching from old crop into new crop. Um, the old crop supplies are still relatively tight. Uh, we have some concerns about making sure that the uh, ending stocks balance, balance sheet numbers uh, work out appropriately. So we're seeing some uh, juggling going on at the, at the last minute here. Um, really, I think a lot of farmers right now are primarily focused on the new crop contracts. Do you feel the demand market has remained strong for soybeans? Well, so far it has. Actually, if you look at the uh, forward bookings or forward sales for 2014 soybeans, uh, we're up about 5% from this time last year, which is a, which is a nice number to be at. Um, the surprising thing is that actually the Chinese orders have been down a bit from last year. So my suspicion is with the large size of the South American crop, the expectation for a very large crop here in the U.S., uh, China being our, our major uh, export destination is sitting back and, and waiting to see what the numbers finally turn out to be. If you're looking for a little bit of a bounce in the short term, where could that come from? At least in North Dakota, we had a very wide planting window. Uh, we had kind of a tough spring and some of the soybeans that were planted were also planted very, very late. The other thing that's happened again in both in North Dakota and Minnesota have been a, kind of a cool summer. Uh, cool summer in the central plains into Nebraska and Iowa mean really big yields for corn and beans. Up here it becomes kind of a problem for us because we, we get a little behind in crop development. So one of the things I'm looking for and a bit concerned about is the potential for a frost, in particular early frost. If that happens, um, you know, we're going to have a response in the bean market because there will be quite a few acres that are affected. What about long-term, Frayne? Is there a, a way that we could see a big bounce maybe mid-fall or into and uh, through winter? We'll be watching the export sales very closely to find out what kind of a pace are we going to be able to take this year. The other part we're going to be focusing on is how is South American acreage going to respond to these lower prices for both corn and beans. Um, when we had really high corn prices, high bean prices, uh, we saw a production response both in Brazil and Argentina. They increased their soybean acres, they increased their corn acres. Um, now with the retracement that we've seen in the markets, what's the res production response going to be out of South America? The current expectation is you will see some shifting of corn acres back into soybeans, but we may actually see some soybean acres also leaving the market, depending upon what part of the region you're talking about. So the first thing we'll be looking for is planted acreage, and of course later on in the season, by the time we get into March, April time period, then South America will begin their key reproductive stages and, and will be determining yield. So there's a couple windows where the market's going to be watching south very, very closely. 
a general question on corn. As you look at that market, what are some things uh, or selling strategies to consider as we move into a big 2014 harvest? Yeah, the, the 2014 harvest is going to be very interesting. And I think we're going to have to kind of go back in time a little bit to be thinking about marketing strategies. Um, I suspect what's going to happen is the first issue we're going to be faced is some storage space, storage issues. Um, there's uh, yeah, unfortunately still quite a bit of 2013 corn that hasn't been sold and hasn't been moved out yet. We're looking at a very large 2014 crop of both corn and beans. Um, I think storage space is going to be at a premium this year. Typically what happens when we have a big crop, the basis levels at harvest tend to widen out. The, the cash market saying we don't need it right now will pay you a, or it provide an incentive for you to store it and deliver it later. So I do think there will be some disincentives for delivering right off the combine. As we move um, after the crop has found a home, as we move into I think in particular after the first of the year we'll start to see a bit of a recovery and there might be some better pricing opportunities then. Tell me about the current condition of spring wheat frame. Yeah, the spring wheat crop, we're just starting harvest now, which again is very late for us. Typically, we're a little bit earlier in the season. Um, the early spring wheat, wheat yields have been pretty strong. We are seeing some uh, reports of scab. Um, we, we also uh, saw quite a bit of scab in the winter wheat. Now, North Dakota doesn't have a lot of winter wheat acres, but because of the development stages, the winter wheat crop has had a lot of scab. So if you hear some reports about what's happening, recognize that that's primarily a winter wheat crop. We have seen some in the early spring wheat. Um, the expectation right now is that as we move through harvest that the, hopefully the scab problem will, will dissipate. But uh, yields are expected to be really good. I haven't heard anything yet about protein content and the quality issues, but we'll keep you posted. Next week, Luke Beckman from Central Valley Ag will join us to analyze corn and soybean markets ahead of the September crop report. Nebraska is still in the midst of soybean aphid season. The pest thrives in temperatures between 75 and 80 degrees, while weather above 90 degrees hinders and can even reduce its development. Under ideal conditions, soybean aphid populations can double in two to three days. As we first told you in April 2013, Tom Hunt is part of a group looking to incorporate aphid tolerance into a soybean variety. At a recent Nebraska Soybean Board sponsored field day in Auburn, we talked with Tom again and asked him for an update on that work. Well, we were working with a line we got from Kansas, KS4202, and this was a line of soybeans that aphids would build up on, but the, the line could tolerate a lot of insect injury without having a large yield hit. So instead of getting 30 to 35 percent yield reductions, you might get 13 percent max. And so we thought this is an opportunity to look at this bean and maybe move it into uh, breeding lines. And why did you think that would help farmers? Because there's no resistance. They might still have to treat. Yes, this isn't immunity at all. But what happens is a lot of times farmers, they either get in there late and the aphids are already built up to high numbers. You're already getting yield loss. Or what often happens, the spray applicator can't get there for a week. And you can lose 10, 15, 20 percent in a week and a half if the guy can't get there. So this way, if there were delays, you wouldn't suffer such a hard hit. The other thing you might be able to do is then put anti antibiotic genes, like you've heard of maybe the RAG genes, aphid resistant genes in certain soybean lines. Well, aphids overcome these in a few years, but I think if we put these genes in these tolerant lines, as the aphids would get over, start to overcome the RAG gene, well then they, again, you wouldn't suffer a big yield hit. You'd have more time to deal with the crop. You'd have more time to get more genes into some of our lines. And so it would just kind of buffer the process and the farmer wouldn't suffer when bad things happen. Can you tell me more about how the plant is able to handle more aphids without getting that damage right away? Well, we're not sure of the complete mechanism. It looks like some peroxidase genes are involved and some other um, mechanisms of the plant that the plant uses to defend against insect pests and even maybe disease disease pests. And so what happens sometimes these mechanisms can, in, after a while, cause some cell death and problems of their own. So what the uh, this plant is able to do is to buffer those responses so they don't become severe later. And so the aphids can thrive and then the plant doesn't suffer very much. So that's basically. Now, you're working with uh, George Graff who works at UNL as well as a plant breeder to try and incorporate this into a line that would be commercial avail commercially available, yes? Yes, this is a line that Tiffany Hang Moss and I have been working with a few years with various students and now we have a student, Leah Markey, that is working with George Graff to incorporate this into his breeding program. Because finding a line that's interesting is one thing, but get, it's got to get to the public and that's where the breeders come in. If it doesn't get to a breeder, 
then what does it mean? And so George is now working with that to incorporate, put it into his high yielding lines, maybe some, anti, some disease resistance and maybe, and, and also some of those rag genes, those antibiotic resistance to soybean aphids. So we hope, have, have great hopes for that. Do you see this as something that could be used in any region of Nebraska, or do you think it's something that would have to be used in a specific growing area? I think it's something if you, it could be used in any region. If you're developing some lines that are whatever group, whatever region, um, these would be good lines. It's a good yielding bean as it is, but uh, it's the type of thing that would be nice for, for pretty much any region. And there's probably other lines out there that are tolerant. So the other nice thing about this is Tiffany's lab is also looking at the genes involved, so maybe then we can screen some other lines to see similar types of tolerance in other lines, and then they can go into other breeding programs for other regions. Now, uh, one of the questions, and maybe you don't know, but uh, are there any trade-offs to putting this into a line? Uh, we haven't seen that yet, and that's exactly what Leah and George are looking at also in their uh, breeding program. She's doing a lot of work in the greenhouse right now. Eventually, then it'll come out to the field where it'll be up in northeast Nebraska, but that's one of the things we're looking at. But so far, it doesn't look like there's a problem there. This work is funded by the North Central Soybean Research Program, a multi-state collaboration which invests soybean checkoff funds. The Nebraska Soybean Board contributes to this program. For more information on scouting and treating aphids, you can view our interview with Bob Wright from the August 8th episode of Market Journal. We'll have more from this soybean management field day later in the show. Husker Harvest Day's Nebraska's Big Outdoor Ag Expo will be ready for thousands of visitors September 9th through 11th. The September Nebraska farmer provides loads of information about the 37th annual farm show at its permanent site west of Grand Island. The Husker Harvest Day show program is inside the September Nebraska farmer and includes more than 100 pages of what's new at the 2014 event. You can learn about products at the show, see a schedule of events, and find associations and companies that will be on the grounds. It's all in the special September issue of Nebraska Farmer. As you heard in last week's market analysis segment with Jim Robb, cow-calf producers are looking to see unprecedented returns this year. July's USDA cattle report showed the lowest inventory of cattle and calves on that date since the series began in 1973. That report also showed the agency's expectation of a 2014 calf crop down 1% from 2013 and 2% from 2012. While feeders are benefiting from cheaper corn and soybean rations, the tighter supply means more expensive animals. With good margins possible for cow-calf producers, we talked last week with Aaron Berger about things to consider when marketing this year's calf crop. We're seeing record high prices and so we're obviously excited about the opportunity to market into this kind of situation, but I think also with it, it just kind of brings a situation where what do we do with these calves? If uh, you know we have a calf crop here, we have record prices. If do we want to retain ownership on those calves? We've seen these forage prices drop. We've seen things like distillers grains come down, and we've had some good rains, especially in the sand hills, and so we have some forage available. And looking at what's the value of the gain on those calves if we're going to either sell maybe traditionally in an October time frame, or do we? want to put some gain on those calves on some meadow regrowth or maybe use some forage that we grew with some distillers and, and thinking about what the value of that gain is and what we could expect to get for adding that gain. If you are going to retain ownership, what are some things to keep in mind? You know, I think as we think about retaining ownership, knowing your cost of production in terms of what's it going to take to put a, a pound of gain on a calf, what's that going to cost? And then really, what's the value of that gain? As we look at these feed yard cost of gains really cheapening up, you know, we're looking down in the low 70s now. Uh, there's going to be a lot of tremendous pressure, I think, on the value of this gain. And so knowing that the value you put on or you really get paid for, I think, is going to be important. I think along with that is thinking about if you're going to retain ownership, uh, some risk management to go with that. Again, we have some record high prices, so how can you uh, use some tools, whether those be uh, options or futures, or maybe using a tool like livestock risk protection insurance to take some price protection, leave the upside open, but protect the downside and, and lock in a profit. You were talking about putting on gain. How affordable is it right now? How affordable are the forages or the distillers? Uh, certainly we know in the eastern part of the state the corn's very affordable, but what about here? Yeah, you know, here in western Nebraska, distillers grains prices have really uh, cheapened up significantly. We've seen huge drops since we saw those in late May. And so really we can get distillers grains bought uh, FOB the plant, you know, 85 to 110 right now. So that puts us delivered, you know, somewhere maybe that 120, 130 area. Uh, that really becomes a very nice complement to some grange forage we would have. Uh, provides us an opportunity to add some value to these calves uh, through some good gains. 
You say if you are going to market them, it's important to have a marketing plan. Why is that so important? Yeah, you know, I think having a plan in place where you've really decided ahead of time what you're going to do, it's too easy to allow the emotions of the market and some fluctuations and market changes to uh, keep you from maybe doing something you should do. So I think visiting about your marketing plan with the people who are part of your team, putting it in writing, and then putting that where people see it and then just uh, making a commitment that when we have an opportunity to do something that meets our plan, we're gonna pull the trigger and do that. When you look at an industry that's still trying to rebuild the cow herd, 95 million all totaled on Ju uh, July 1st, uh, will there be a different value this year between heifers and those that aren't heifers? Yeah, I really think there is, especially those heifers that have the quality to go back to the cow herd. You know, we often see a pretty wide spread between our uh, steers and heifer prices. I think that's gonna be more narrow this year. I think if you're in a situation where you can bag vaccinate those heifers and maybe background them till after the first of the year, I think there's going to be real demand for those heifers to go into a breeding program. Or if you really want to put a pencil to it, see if you have extra feed about maybe retaining those heifers and developing them yourselves. Uh, bred females are going to be good property here in the near term, and I think looking how you can capture value from that is really an important option this year. The USDA is expecting a shift in profits this year between livestock producers and crop growers. The agency this week said it expects livestock receipts to increase by more than 15 percent in 2014, while forecasting a drop in crop receipts of 7 percent. Overall, the USDA is projecting net farm income at $113.2 billion, down about 14 percent from last year. Next week, Tina Barrett from Nebraska Farm Business will join us to discuss the possible gap in income between livestock and crop producers in this state. Aaron mentioned the affordability of distillers' grains. UNL's Cornhusker Economics listed the price for mid-August at just less than $96 per ton, $10 cheaper than a month ago and about $140 more affordable per ton than in April. At the Goodmanson Sandhills lab last week, Aaron Stalker said that lower cost could be an option for cattle producers if they can store the product. The price is really attractive right now and it, it for some producers it might be a really good option to lock in that right now. When it, now is not the time to use it though. Uh, you know, it's later on in the year uh, during the winter time when the, those nutrients that are in the distillers grains could really be put to best use. and. Uh, so, so since we, we've got this issue, well, well, now's the time to buy, but we don't need to use it until later, why uh, a really good solution for that would be storage. Now, what challenges does that bring in? Not only storing, but trying to get it to this part of the state. Yeah, um, transportation is certainly an issue. The further away you are from an ethanol plant, the, um, the more attractive dry distillers grains are. Uh, wet distillers grains is also a good option, but a lot of times it's the, fr the cost of transporting all that water that, that can kind of uh, make it where dry distillers grains becomes a more economical option. And then storage uh, works equally well, uh, whether we're talking about dry distillers or wet distillers. Um, there's just lots of options that are available. Uh, we've done a lot of work at, with that historically here at UNL and we have um, a lot of resources available on our webpage. And I'd just like to encourage everybody to go to our webpage, beef.unl.edu and uh, look at all the wonderful resources we have about storing and utilizing distillers grains on a cow-calf operation. If someone hasn't done it before, is it a daunting thing to do? Well, I think, you know, like, like a lot of uh, new things, it takes a little bit of adjustment and, and certainly there are some, some um, you know, adaptations that are going to be required, but we've, you know, worked with a lot of people and, and have, that have been really successful and, you know, certainly the cost savings uh, are going to more than compensate for a little bit of an adjustment that might be made. And I think what most people realize is that it's not nearly as difficult as what it might seem on the surface when they actually uh, get their sleeves rolled up and, and in the middle of it they realize, well, it's, it's, it's not uh, terribly difficult uh, and, and not really as big of an adjustment as it might seem on the surface. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to more information on storing distillers' grains. Soybean farmers may soon have more options to battle resistance. Pending regulatory approval, growers could be able to utilize Roundup Ready Extend and Endless Duo. But as we've heard in interviews during previous episodes of Market Journal, the rise in weed resistance means those producers will still need to have a diversified control program. At the recent Nebraska Soybean Board-sponsored Soybean Management Field Day in Auburn, Greg Kruger talked with us about how these new tools need to be managed. 
we think back to 96, we had Roundup Ready hit the market. And that was a, an introduction of a herbicide resistance trait that allowed us to use a herbicide that would otherwise kill the crop over the top for weed control management. Uh, Roundup Ready Extend is the exact same thing, uh, except for now we've got a trait for Roundup resistance and for dicamba resistance. And with Enlist Duo, it's uh, the same thing, except for instead of dicamba resistance, we're talking about 2,4-D resistance. So these are new herbicide resistance traits that are going to allow us to use products that were existing on the market in a new use. Right, and farmers probably love that they have a new tool to use, right? But... Well, it, our soybean farmers uh, in particular uh, see this as a, a huge opportunity. We, we're dealing with resistance. Uh, we've talked a lot about that over the last few years in terms of uh, mare's tail or horseweed uh, showing up as glyphosate resistant in the state. Now we've got uh, common ragweed, giant ragweed, water hemp, palmer amaranth, and kochia to add to that list. So we're getting a few weed species out there that are resistant. Uh, these are very problematic weeds, uh, but they're resistant to glyphosate. Uh, 240 and dicamba are actually uh, both uh, effective uh, on uh, a number of those weed species. So it gives our applicators a new tool to come over uh, the top of soybeans like we have behind us and clean those up. This is a perfect site for that because uh, in the background you can kind of see some of the water hemp and uh, the mare's tail sticking up. Uh, in, a, in a year or two when these traits become available, uh, we'll be able to come and post emergence and clean those up. But uh, as we've mentioned in previous stories and stuff, it's really important that growers don't become reliant on this new technology or this new trait as the, the rescue for Roundup Ready, but yet another tool in the toolbox, so to speak. With these new products, what are you emphasizing to producers on how to get ideal applications? Yeah, so this is the most important part of, of, of what we're talking about with these new traits is making sure that we get the application set up right. Uh, Roundup was really flexible, so we could spray it with a flat fan, we could spray it with the TTI nozzle, uh, we could get a, a 100 micron droplet or 1,000 micron droplet, and we were gonna get that product to work really well. Uh, with these new traits, uh, uh, with 240 and dicamba, they're a little bit more uh, uh, specific in terms of the way we need to apply them, both in terms of making sure that we get effective weed control and making sure that we minimize the off-target movement. So in terms of off-target movement, it's pretty simple. We, we want large droplets. The larger the droplet, the better. In terms of weed control, it's uh, unfortunately the opposite. We've got a really small range of, of droplet sizes that we are gonna want for effective weed control. So uh, what we're gonna see with the Roundup Ready Extend, so, uh, Monsanto and BASF are, are really gonna get behind the TTI nozzle. It's an ultra coarse spray quality. They're worried about the off-target movement. Uh, that canvas seems to be a little bit more flexible in terms of uh, uh, droplet size on the large end. With Enlist Duo, we're really looking at making sure we get uh, in that coarse to very coarse range. The extremely coarse and ultra coarse are probably just a little bit too large a droplet size for those type of applications to make sure we get really effective weed control from those products. The resistance we've seen so far, do you think nozzle control or nozzle selection is going to be even more important as we move forward? Absolutely, uh, both uh, in terms of resistance management and in terms of efficacy, uh, the nozzle selection is a very important tool that we have in our toolbox. Uh, there's no other uh, tool that we have that can really give us the range uh, that nozzle selection can in terms of droplet size. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist, Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here again for the weekly forecast. During this last week, of course, we had a very active pattern during the midweek period as we had that upper air low out in the central Rockies slowly migrate eastward. And as energy pivoted around that system, of course, we had thunderstorms development on almost a daily basis. The heaviest precipitation for this past week occurred from essentially central Nebraska, east northeastward through the Omaha metropolitan area. Uh, numerous locations report, reported well over five inches during this entire storm event with a couple of locations around or York pushing well over seven inches. In the southeastern, extreme southeastern part of the state, precipitation totals were not nearly as robust as we would want. This is the area that has seen an upgrade to moderate drought conditions due to the lack of moisture during the, uh, the July through mid-August period. So even though we had rainfall, we would expect that the improvements in this region will be a little bit slower, a couple more rain events, and we may see the elimination of those events. So let's take a look and see what the upper air models are gonna bring us for this week. And for today, the first system that was responsible for our precipitation has weakened and has moved out to the Great Lakes region. In its wake, we see a little brief ridging. So for today, we're looking at fairly nice conditions across the state. And for the opening of the Husker football, looks to be temperatures somewhere in the low 
to mid 80 degree range, so very nice conditions. We have another trough that's going to start working its way toward our region. May generate some thunderstorm activity during the late evening overnight hours across western Nebraska. But more importantly, as this trough pushes eastward, we could see the development of severe weather across the eastern half of Nebraska and all of Iowa as we go into tomorrow afternoon. That will generate the possibility of upwards of a couple inches of moisture across eastern Nebraska, most locations are probably looking at a half an inch, and then that system will pass to the east of us, and on Monday, we'll get a temporary reprieve, a little bit cooler conditions, but most of the energy will remain to our north, and as we get into Tuesday, we'll see that that trough starts to move toward the Great Lakes, and there is a chance it will develop on the southern periphery of this trough. Some thunderstorm activity, particularly from north central Nebraska, southeastward into extreme southeastern Nebraska, and points eastward. Now as we go into Wednesday, we start to see a flattening out of the ridge, so any thunderstorm development that occurs will be in the western part of the state as it picks up some of this monsoon moisture. Very little chance across eastern Nebraska, at least on Wednesday, and we will start to see warmer temperatures move into our region more back to normal to above normal across the entire state. On Thursday, the ridge builds in a little bit more aggressively. So once again, the monsoon moisture will target western and northern Nebraska with less of a chance across southern Nebraska. And on Friday, we start to see a southwest flow off and that's gonna bring monsoon moisture in along with this trough. We'll start to see another wet pattern developing uh, as we go into the late weekend and the early part of the following week. So if we look at the temperature forecast, we're gonna remain cool here in the early part of the week, and then we'll start to see that warm up with increasing chances of thunderstorm activity, particularly eastern Nebraska. Eight to 14 day forecast keeps the warm temperatures in place and precipitation tends to be above normal. Thanks, Al. Today's information on soybean markets, soybean aphid research, selling this year's calf crop, storing distillers grains, and new options for weed control can be found individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. Next week, Luke Beckman will be our corn and soybean market analyst, and Tina Barrett will talk about 2014 farm incomes. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board, the Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Whether it's spring planting, fall harvesting, or just a drive across the state, Soy Bio Diesel helps a diesel-powered engine operate in a demanding job. Soybean oil from Nebraska soybeans makes biodiesel a renewable fuel that's also environmentally responsible. The soybean checkoff plays a major role in supporting the use and availability of biodiesel. The Nebraska Soybean Board, growing opportunity from the ground up.